Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it is a uh, tremendous privilege to, to be here this morning. Um, when I looked on my calendar early on in the year, at uh, April 19th, I was expecting a few more people. But uh, by God's grace, his gospel will continue to go forth, and he will still be exalted. We have, you know, the great opportunity with technology. We were talking about it this morning. What the enemy means for evil, God will still use for good. And so we are, we are thankful for that. Um, I want to say, uh, send greetings from the church in Slave Lake um, and send greetings to the church in Slave Lake. I think, um, I know my family uh, is watching. Um, and so I do pray that you will be blessed. Uh, before we go any further into this message, let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing again on this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word. Lord, as we discussed this morning, to try to come up with uh, a message, to try to come up with some encouragement out of ourselves is impossible. But God, your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, and yet it is also a comfort to those who are afflicted. All at the same time, Father, your spirit can bruise those who are high and, and in pride, and it can comfort those who are bruised. And I thank you, Father, for your spirit and your word, and I pray this morning that as your word goes forth, Lord, that it will bring forth the fruit that you have prepared for it. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the scripture we'll be reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Now, one of the things that I, I like to do when I am preaching is I like to kind of give a bit of an introduction to myself. Um, I have a way of communicating that can sometimes get missed or get misunderstood. Um, I often use the words you when I am preaching because I am preaching to you. But I, want, I don't want anyone to ever forget that this message has been preached to me all week long and before that even. These are truths that I have had to wrestle through all week long. And so when I preach and I say you, never, never misunderstand that I have not preached this to me. And even this morning, I am talking to myself. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So in our scripture this morning, the Holy Spirit through Peter was writing to churches that were suffering tremendously. Most, if not all, biblical churches down through the ages have suffered. And so the Holy Ghost through Peter wants to encourage his suffering people. Now, our churches today have a great advantage 
in that we have the opportunity to prepare our hearts before suffering truly hits. So, as things have been progressing with our COVID response, with the governments making decisions to obviously limit the amount of people that can worship on a Sunday morning, we're beginning to see certain disturbing trends. Uh, last Easter, there was a church in, uh, in Nippon, Saskatchewan, which is only 30-some-odd kilometers from where I grew up, that wanted to have a drive-in Easter service. Everyone would remain in their cars, and they would listen to their shortwave uh, radio, and they would hear the gospel, and the church could see each other, and it would be a, a blessing. Unfortunately, the media got a hold of it, and the police shut it down. Yet it's not against the law to sit in your car. It's an arbitrary power grab. A couple weeks ago, a pastor in Calgary, maybe it was even last week, a pastor in Calgary was given a $1,200 fine for feeding the homeless. Now these homeless people could go to a liquor store, they could go to a marijuana dispensary, but if they stopped on the street outside to receive food from this pastor, they were breaking the law. And so these are isolated incidents, but we can see in the horizon, if we're honest, if we just look to the horizon, we can see there is trouble coming for God's church in the West. There's been a growing animosity against Christians. And so we, as I said, have a great advantage. We can prepare our hearts before the suffering even hits. See, these young Christians that Peter is writing to, these are, this is the early church. These people just came to Christ. They came and they believed on Jesus and they were saved and they were so excited and all of a sudden, everything turned against them. Their communities turned against them. The government turned against them. And we know that Peter himself ended up being crucified upside down for his faith. See, we have the opportunity to prepare our hearts for suffering. So let's consider these words from Peter. We'll start in verse 3. Verses 1 to 3, they, 1 and 2, they're so full of theology I could preach messages on that. But for the sake of time, we're just going to go to verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is where everything always begins for the Christian. We were talking about it again this morning. In Him, in God, we live and move and have our being. Everything starts with God. When Jesus taught His disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer, which we already heard, it starts with the acknowledgement of God's hallowed name. Our prayers don't even start with us. They start with Him. All glory and praise and honor goes to him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You look at what he writes here. He says, which according to his abundant mercy. Not just mercy. Mercy from God would be great. But God doesn't just give us mercy. He gives us abundant mercy mercy. And when you think of abundant mercy, then you realize that we are abundantly undeserving, right? If the mercy is abundant, that means that the receiver of said mercy really does not deserve it. And again, this is where we must begin when we think about suffering, we think about the blessed God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. He has begotten us again. Again, we look at the plan of salvation. We look at what we have received in Christ. God planned it. God initiated it. God sustains it. And God will get all the glory and the praise for it. 
when we think of suffering, this is where we must begin. It begins with God and meditating on his abundant mercy that he has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a lively or living hope. Our hope isn't dead because like we all heard last Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, that tomb is empty. The tomb is empty and Jesus is alive. Therefore, we have a living hope. We have a hope that is alive. And a hope to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Many people on earth leave an inheritance to their children. In fact, the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Either money or real estate. But whatever the inheritance is, it will disappear. Whatever the inheritance is, it will break down. If it's a, if it's a tangible thing like a clock or a, you know, a, an, an onyedank, as, as they say in German, it will disappear in time because it is corruptible. It will break down. These, these valuable things that we, we pass down generation to generation will not last forever. And yet we have in heaven an inheritance that is incorruptible. It will never break down. It is undefiled. It is pure. It is spotless. There is no defilement within it. And it fadeth not away. Recently, my, a cousin of mine, he purchased a Suburban for his family He posted pictures of it on WhatsApp. He was really impressed. Uh, The Suburban, I don't know exactly the year. I want to say 1982 or 1983, something to that effect. And uh, he put new tires on it, and he's driving around in the mud with it, and he's having a great time. But the one thing that I noticed, he sent one picture, and and, uh, he he had some stuff on the hood of of the Suburban. And I noticed that the paint was virtually gone. It was highly faded. And when you think about this, this, this vehicle is 1982. That's not that long ago, right? Some of us can remember 1982. I, I might not have been born yet, but you know, I know 1982 wasn't that long ago. And yet this vehicle that used to be shiny and beautiful is now rusted and decayed. It faded away. That paint job thoroughly faded away. And yet we have an inheritance from God, incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I don't know how many of you have ever gone to a fancy restaurant with your spouse or anything. You know, the restaurants where you have to make a reservation. You can't just walk up. So you make a reservation. And before you ever show up, The table is already prepared. The people in the restaurant know that you are coming. And they set up the table and they prepare it for you. And it's as though you're already there as far as they're concerned. They take care of it. They make sure that it's ready. And that is what we have in heaven. We have a reserve, our our inheritance, sorry, is reserved in heaven. It's just waiting. You imagine the great marriage supper of the Lamb. There's this huge table, and it has names on this table, and your name is there. It's already done. In Christ, it is finished. It's reserved in heaven for you. They're just waiting. It's not time for supper yet, but it will be one day. And one day, we will all be gathered together, and there we will be. And we will finally receive that inheritance that we are now waiting for. Verse 5, we are kept, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We were discussing again this morning, man, how many times am I going to go back to our little discussions from this morning, but we were discussing this morning just about how much we need God, how much, how dependent we are on the power of God. And this verse, boy, oh boy, does this verse ever lay it out for us. 
who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. If you were supposed to keep yourself saved, you'd be lost immediately. If you were supposed to depend on your strength, you would be in trouble. Ephesians 4.20 warns us that we are to not grieve the Holy Spirit of promise, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. When you are born again, you are sealed unto the day of redemption, according to the word of God. In John chapter 10, verses 28 to 29, Jesus speaks of his sheep, and he says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And as if that wasn't a good enough promise for us to rest in, Jesus goes on and he says, And my Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Our salvation, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What a glorious, glorious truth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it speaks of suffering and it says that we are to be looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author. It was his idea. And he is the finisher. He will keep you. He will sustain you. He will strengthen you. These are promises that he has given us. Verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Finally, in verse 6, he gets to the point that he was making. The suffering that they're going through. The manifold temptations. And he acknowledges, with a, with a pastor's heart, he acknowledges that they are in heaviness. He acknowledges that they are in pain. And that they are in difficulty. He doesn't just simply pretend that it doesn't exist. We deal with very real and true emotions. We have grief. We have pain. We have sorrow. These things are true. However, he says these things are needful. These things are needful. He says, if need be, ye are in heaviness. If you are suffering, it is because it was needed for you. We love to quote Romans 8.28, all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. But sometimes we think about that verse, we think that that's a verse that gets us out of trouble. But a lot of times, it's that God wants to sustain us in our trouble. I was driving in my car from Slave Lake to here yesterday, and and I was singing a song, and you know when you drive by yourself, you can really give her, right? Uh, Granted, I sing that way when my kids are in the car and my wife anyway, but... So I'm really singing this song, and and, and the the lyrics said that sometimes he calms the storm, but other times he calms his child. We have this idea that God might take us out of the suffering, and he says, no, the suffering is needful. He says, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. George Mueller, a man that we know much of, or at least you should, I recommend that you read George Mueller if you haven't. But George Mueller, in regards to his dying wife, wrote this. He said, The last portion of scripture which I read to my precious wife was this. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Psalm 84, 11. I said to myself, with regard to the latter part, No good thing will he withhold to them that walk uprightly. I am in myself a poor worthless sinner, but I have been saved by the blood of Christ, and I do not live in sin. I walk uprightly before God. Therefore, if it is really good for me, my darling wife will be raised up again, sick as she is. 
God will restore her again. But if she is not restored again, then it would not be a good thing for me. And so my heart was at rest. I was satisfied with God. And all this springs, as I have said often before, from taking God at his word and believing what he says. I have not had to suffer like George Mueller did there. His wife was dying before his eyes. And he basically said, God has promised that no good thing will he withhold. So if my wife dies, then that is good for me. She died February 6th, 1870, when Mueller was 64 years old. He never wavered in his faith, and he preached at her funeral from Psalm 119, verse 68, Thou art good and doest good. He recounted how he preached to himself as she was dying, If God pleases to take my dearest wife, it will be good, like himself. What I have to do as his child is to be satisfied with what my father does, that I may glorify him. You see, your trial of faith is good. And the trial of faith that is coming for the church is good. It is for our benefit. Verse 7, it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Here we are told that the trial of faith is actually precious. More precious than gold. It's interesting how gold is so valuable. And it's always been that way. In, in as long as written history has been, gold has been valuable. Solomon, when he built his temple, one of the things that was so glorious about his temple was that it was all gold. There was so much gold that they stopped counting. It was just, there was just too much gold to even count. And it was glorious. In Jesus' day, gold was very precious. And even today, gold is very precious. Now, the prices of, of gold, they fluctuate a lot. But I was curious, so last week, or on Wednesday, April 15th, I checked the value of one gold bar in Canadian dollars. One gold bar, which is approximately 438 ounces, last Wednesday, April 15th, was valued at $1,065,355.14. One bar. And yet the Bible says, Peter, through the Holy Spirit, says, the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold. Gold, it seems to Peter, is just like a footnote. Estunush. It's nothing. Compared to a trial? Oh, a trial. Now that is something. It says the trial of your faith, it will purify you. It will purge out all that which is not like Christ within you, so that your faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to detour here for a moment. I want to detour here for a moment with a warning to the professing church. I believe that the modern church, by and large, does not have a proper view of suffering and is unprepared for the coming suffering. How do I know that? Well, there's a few things. One of the ways that you can tell that the modern church is unprepared is by the success of heretical movements, heretical false Christian movements. There's the success of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Now, the gospel, the prosperity gospel isn't actually a gospel. Rather, it is a scheme where the preacher gets rich off of unsuspecting donors. Jesus died so that you can be free, they say, free from being poor. You see, 
it's all about money. Preachers like Kenneth Copeland and Creflo Dollar teach that if you give, generally to their ministry, then God will then bless you. Then there is the success of the gospel of self. The gospel of self basically puts you in the middle of God's plan. Whatever God is doing in the earth, it is for you. Now, while it's true that you have value and that you are loved by God, probably more than you can even understand, it is not true that Jesus Christ came into the world so that you can live your best life now and that you can improve your self-esteem. False teachers like Joel Olstein and Rick Warren and Stephen Furtick preach a message that has you dead center. Jesus, if he is mentioned at all, is usually here to make sure things go well for you. Then there's the success of the charismatic NAR movement. NAR stands for New Apostolic Reformation. Now these churches teach that the gifts and powers and get this authority of the apostles is still around today. Now you may not have heard of Bethel Church in Redding, California, but it's very likely that you have heard the songs by Jesus Culture. Jesus Culture is a ministry of Bethel Church in Reading. The focal point of these churches is the apostolic power of healing. It is what they use to attract people. And the results are tragic. Hashtag wake up olive was trending on social media back in December when a member of Bethel Church's praise team's two-year-old daughter tragically died. For weeks, they attempted to wake up Olive because they believed that she would be resurrected. I want you to think about the pain that these parents are going through. First of all, that they lost their daughter. And second of all, that the only reason that their daughter wasn't alive was because they didn't have enough faith. Because if they had had enough faith, they would have been able to wake up Olive. Incidentally, the healing rooms at Bethel, you know the rooms where you go for healing, are closed due to the coronavirus. Now you might be thinking, well, we don't follow any of these false teachers. I've actually never even heard of them until today. And that's probably true, and I, I pray that it is. But their message, that God wants you healthy and wealthy and happy, has gone out with such power and has gone out with such volume that it has penetrated even Bible-believing churches. See, these are multi-million dollar organizations that have incredible clout on social media and on TV. And as a result, even Bible-believing Christians get sucked into this idea that if I am suffering, something is wrong. That if I am sick, something is wrong. And we become like Job's friends. When someone is sick, we think to ourselves, well, what did you do? When someone is suffering, we say, well, they have obviously sinned. Why else would they be suffering? And that's completely unbiblical. Here's the questions we need to ask ourselves. Do we believe that it could be God's will for us to be poor, sick, and suffering? Do we believe that suffering is actually beneficial and something to be welcomed into our lives if God so permit? Because according to Peter, the trial of your faith is much more precious than that of gold that perishes. I want to give you three quick examples of where we as a church in Western, in Western nations, in North America, three quick examples of where we choose, we choose to avoid any kind of suffering. The first one is our debt load. Many Christians today have just as much debt as the unsaved world around us. You see, we are not willing to wait to save, 
ultimately to suffer by going without. Even though the Bible says that the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender, in Proverbs 22, 7, we willingly, voluntarily, put ourselves in bondage because we will not suffer. My friend owns a, something that I want. I don't actually have the cash for it. I'll just finance it. Oh, we need a, two, we need a new TV. Well, we'll just finance it. Our house needs new furniture. Oh, we'll just finance it. And yet the Bible says the borrower is a servant or a slave to the lender. The Bible doesn't say that debt is a good idea, and yet Christians are running headlong. Why? Because we don't want to suffer. We don't want to risk going without. And then there's our ever-increasing desire for more leisure, more rest, more relaxation. Now, I have to be careful with this one because I don't want to ever give the impression that we do not need rest, leisure, or relaxation. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Our physical bodies need rest. Our physical bodies need a break. Our minds need a break from the daily grind of life. And if you don't take a rest, your body will force you to take a rest. You know, one of the things I've... I, uh, my family, we homeschool our, our children. And as a result, my girls, they don't need to be awake you know, at 7 o'clock in the morning to catch a bus. Um, so we have a bit of a different schedule, what works for us. But the problem is, I do need to be awake early in the morning so that I can get to work on time. And so what happens is, I, uh, I generally get, you know, about six hours of sleep a night, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, depending on the night. But as this goes on, day after day after day after day, at some point, my body finally says, you know what? You need a rest. And I get sick. And so, this happened to me a while ago. All of a sudden, I was sleeping 13 to 15 hours in a day for a few days, for about a week, as my body recovered. So we do need rest. But this is about our ever-increasing desire for more. For more rest and for more comfort, for more leisure, for more vacations. Let's just get away from everything. And I want to think about this for a moment. This is something that I've often thought about. Our churches, or our Sunday schools, have to stop during the summer because we don't have enough people. Everybody's gone. And yet the Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more when you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10.25. Where is everybody? Well, we're too busy. We're camping. We're taking trips. We're on vacation. Now, again, I'm not saying that taking a camping trip is a sin. Spending time with your family, taking a vacation. We need these things. This is about an ever-increasing desire for more, even to the expense of the scripture. And finally, number three, it's our lack of concern for the lost. Our lack of concern for the lost. Here's a question. This is a tough question. This is one that I've had to wrestle with. When was the last time you spoke to someone who is not a Christian about Jesus? When you pray, are you praying for Christians? Or do you pray for the lost as well? Does it concern you that a family member without Christ will die and spend eternity in hell? You see, sharing the gospel may make you look foolish. The person, you, you might not know what to say. You might start to stutter and you might chew on your tongue because you, you don't know the answer to their questions. You're going to look like a fool. And so because you know that, you choose to remain silent. You are willing to let them go to hell for your comfort. It's a scary thought. 
But is this where we are at? If we are unwilling to suffer now, what makes us think that we will suffer, be willing to suffer then? Now, at this point, you might be wondering, why are you so concerned about our willingness to suffer? You're a pastor. Shouldn't you be concerned about whether or not we believe in Jesus? I am very concerned. But here's the thing. Your unwillingness to wait until you can afford something, your unwillingness to give up a vacation for Christ, your unwillingness to verbally share Christ with a lost and dying world, ultimately your unwillingness to suffer in these seemingly little things could very well be an indication that you don't actually know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, I know that last statement seems harsh, but when we avoid suffering at all costs, when we seek pleasure and happiness and ease, even if it means ignoring Scripture by going into debt to do it, even if it means ignoring Scripture by forsaking the assembling of the saints week after week, even if it means ignoring the great commission that Jesus gave to us, by never sharing Christ with a world that is going to hell? When you avoid suffering at all costs and seek pleasure, you are revealing a carnal mind and a carnal heart that is more concerned about itself than it is about the will of God. It is a heart that will never actually answer these words. It's a heart that says, maybe, Lord, Ask me later. Right now, i got to go catch the last episode that I missed on Netflix. You see, Romans 8, verses 7 and 8 warn that the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Jesus made a very, very stark warning in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. He said, If any man will come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the same shall save it. See, this is the crux of the issue. Here is the crux of the issue. And this is where every believing Christian, this is where your heart breaks. It's that when true suffering and persecution finally hit the church, those who are living for themselves, those who are living for themselves under the banner of Christianity will fall. You see, if you are not standing for Christ now, you will not stand for Christ then. Jesus gave a parable of the sowers, of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, and he says some soil fell on Stony ground, the fowls took it away. Some soil fell on thorny ground, and it rose up and it was choked. Others fell in shallow soil, and, it, and immediately it sprung up. But when persecution arose because, of the, because they had no earth beneath them, they fell away. I remember when we first moved to Slave Lake. Um, Abe and Rita Dick lived in Slave Lake, and, and we were, had the opportunity to house sit for them. And when, when we first moved, um, I moved about a month before my wife, and she, uh, she came afterwards. And, and so I spent a lot of time at Abe and Rita's. Uh, we, we became pretty good friends through that season. And, and I remember, I'll always remember this story. Rita was talking about the youth. And the youth had been, I don't know if the youth had been there, or, or I don't remember exactly how the story goes, but something to the effect that the youth had been discussing martyrdom, Christian martyrdom, whether or not they were going to die for their faith in Jesus. And of course, the youth were all saying, of course I would die for Jesus. Absolutely, I'll die for Jesus. Somebody puts a gun to my head and says, deny Christ. I won't deny Jesus. I will definitely die for Jesus. And Rita asked the question, if you're going to die for Jesus, then why aren't you dying for Jesus now? And I remember that just really struck me. Because if we are refusing to die now, what makes us think 
that we will die then. If we are living for pleasure on the earth today, what makes us think that we will forsake pleasure then? How many of our young people leave our congregations, they head off to college or they head off to the city to start a new life and they completely desert their faith? We often call them backsliders, but the reality is is that they never really slid forward in the first place. They had shallow soil beneath them. When persecution arises for the sake of the gospel, they leave it. They're offended. They have never seen themselves in the light of the holiness of God, the unbending nature of his law, or his white-hot wrath against sin. You see, when you see yourself in truth, when you see your pride, when you see your perversion, when you see the filth that is in your heart, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, when you see that within you, and you realize that Jesus came to set you free from that sin, And Jesus came so that you could be forgiven for all of those sins. And that Jesus came and he casts your sin into the depths of the sea. By his blood, you are cleansed. When you repent and you turn from your wickedness and you trust in Christ alone, he gives you a new life. And it is only then that verse 8 becomes applicable. Whom not having seen... Ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. There was a man by the name of, I believe his name was Horatio Spafford. We've we've sung the song, It Is Well With My Soul. It's an absolutely incredible song. But that song was written shortly after the death of his children. His son died, and then he lost all of his business in the great Chicago fire. And so they decided to go over to Europe to meet with D.L. Moody. And he had to finish some business, so he sent his wife and daughters across the Atlantic ahead of him. He would come a few days later. And then the ship sank. And his wife was saved alone. His daughters all perished. And yet he wrote, It is well with my soul. How in the world can someone sing, It is well with my soul, under such Incredible grief. He can do it because he has seen himself in truth. He has seen his sin in light of the glories of Jesus Christ. He's seen the depth of his depravity in light of the holiness and purity and glorious beauty of Jesus. And so he can rejoice with joy unspeakable. And he can even sing, it is well with my soul, in the midst of incredible pain. It is not that he didn't cry and weep in agony over his loss. But his loss, he knew, wasn't forever. He was going to miss his children incredibly, but he wasn't going to miss them forever. There was going to be a day when they would be reunited. There was going to be a day when they would see them again. And so the Christian, because of the resurrection, because of what Jesus did for us, we rejoice in the middle of the trial. We have joy unspeakable in the middle of the trial because of Jesus Christ. And that trial, that trial of our faith, which is much more precious than gold, drives us closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ. And it drives us further and further from sin. Because as you go through a trial and you are hit with anguish, Jesus becomes more and more your all. 
Suddenly the things of this world grow strangely dim in light of his glory and grace. In whom, though having not seen, ye love. It's important to note that when we talk about this love for Jesus, we aren't talking about a, a feeling of affection and warm fuzzies inside. You may have those feelings of affection. But ultimately, when Jesus says, talks about love, he, he's saying, prove your love. He says in John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. You see, love is shown by obedience to his written word. Love is shown by obeying Christ. And when you obey Christ, it is then that you can rejoice with joy unspeakable. See, this is a joy that is not based on your circumstances. It is not based on what's going on around you. It's not based on what the government's doing. It's not based on what the virus is doing. It's not based on whether you can be in a church service on Sunday or whether you're stuck at home in a quarantine for the next 14 days. Your joy is based on Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. And you see yourself in light of what Jesus has done for you. And you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Oh, what a glorious day that will be when we will see Jesus face to face. The greatest thing about heaven, out of all of the things, the, the pearls and the amazing streets of gold, the best thing about heaven, the thing that should attract us the most to heaven is because Jesus will be there. Our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be there. And he will welcome you in if you are in Christ. If you know him, if he knows you, he will say, come, good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Allow that promise, allow these truths to strengthen you through the coming trials. And let the warning, let the warning re re reverberate through your soul if you do not know Jesus. If you are living for yourself, if you are living for your flesh, if you are giving in to sin, walking in rebellion to God, none of these promises apply. All that waits for you is the judgment of God. Do not harden your hearts from the glorious love of Jesus Christ. Repent. Turn from your sins. Trust in Jesus Christ. Turn away from your wickedness. Turn towards God. Accept what he has given for you and trust in him. And then allow his truth, his word, to change you as he sanctifies you and makes you most holy, more holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, God, for your promises. We thank you for your truth. But ultimately, Father, we thank you for salvation, which is found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Father, we pray that, that those who are in rebellion, those who are living carnal lives, those who are living for the flesh, Father God, I pray that you would convict even them this morning. Father God, I pray that you would convict them of their sin. Show them their sin. And Lord, may they turn away from their wickedness and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. But Father, for your church, God, may we see suffering for what it really is. Precious. God, it is precious because you have said. And you will sustain your church through the trial. You will be with us every step of the way. You have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us, no matter what comes. We are led as sheep to the slaughter, but nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. God, we are persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come, height, depth, any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God 
which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, may we trust you. May we worship you. May we obey you as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.